Hello Fada, accent on the Irish language, basic notes and background for the curious. From the Hedge School at the Irish Roots Cafe, more courses and information found at www.irishroots.com. Well, welcome to show number 17 for our special studies and extra credit in the uh, Irish Language Head School course. This is Michael Laughlin, your head school uh, leader for this particular session. And uh, hey, we're going to be learning a little bit about Oam or Ogham from a student of this, which was Ireland's first alphabet. Uh, I'll put a sample on our blog for you to take a look at and also on our web pages for uh, Hello Fada at irishroots.com. Renata is very busy with her Irish classes and singing and working at the Irish Center, so be sure and say hello if you're in the area. I know she'd appreciate hearing from you. And uh, we're going to continue our sessions uh, for Season 2 with the Hello Fauna podcast just as soon as I finish current projects. Uh, now we're getting ready to show our feature presentation. It's a good one. And, of course, I want to remind you that uh, both myself and our guest today, Chris, we're both on Facebook and we're both on Twitter, and uh, be sure to look us up. I'll have a link on the blog. Now let's listen in today. Three, two, one. Well, here we are at the Irish Roots Cafe today, and we have a very special guest, as always. We've, you know, we've dug a little bit into uh, um, the Irish language, and Renata has helped us with that, and I'm taking some uh, some courses to sort of figure that out. And I've also looked at the alphabet way back, the very first alphabet about... Uh, uh, well, that's about 3,000 years ago, I think. They said it was in some th something like the El Wadi watering hole or, or something along those lines. Uh, but now we're going to talk about maybe the first alphabet to appear in Ireland and learn a little bit about what they call Oam or o Ogham or Ogham. Uh, I'm seeing, sure if you've seen it written, you understand that's O-G-H. Uh, is that A-M or O-M, Chris? A-M. That's A-M. Well, Chris, tell us a little bit about how you came into your interest with uh, this form of the early language and uh, what you're doing with us now. Okay. Um, back in 1993, uh, I had an opportunity to study at Trinity College Dublin uh, for a course in pre-Christian Celtic traditions. And uh, one of the benefits of the course was actually uh, lots of time for independent study. Um, I used my time to travel throughout the country and explore uh, Ireland as best I could. And as I was doing that, um, I came across Oam stones, uh, particularly in the southwest of the country. And they were certainly interest, interesting and they caught my attention, but they were not necessarily part of the coursework because we were doing pre-Christian. And that's you know something important about Oam. Oam is more than likely... A, a Christian era um, writing system. Now, now for those of us that that aren't really have just maybe seen the word and he's seen some scratches on maybe a plaque, what what is it? How do you know you've run into it? Say you're in Ireland, you're driving driving over there in Kerry, and you see a big old stone sticking up, uh, and it's got some etchings on it. How do you know it's Oam? Um, well, it would be a series of lines, and in some cases there would be a vertical line running from the bottom to the top. Uh, with intersecting lines coming across it or just running perpendicular off the side. Um, they would be anywhere from a foot high to, I've seen them as high as six feet high. And uh, with the lack of a line in the middle, they would use the corner to carve the, um, the, the strike marks into the stone. Now, is there a difference between the vowels and consonant sounds? Well, the... Oam itself is actually just a writing system. It's not necessarily a language, and yes, there are. Um, and similar to the way I like to uh, refer to it is it's almost like fonts. Um, some Oam use strike marks for the vowels, and, and the vowels uh, go across straight, not at an angle, and they, they cut the line. Right. In some cases, they are actually represented with dots, but mm -hmm. it's still the same number. So, for example, an A would be one one strike mark through or one dot. Okay. So it's always the same number. It's just a matter of how they represent it. Now, where do we think this came from? Do you do you, do you call it an alphabet? It is an alphabet. And where do, do we think it came from? Uh, uh, I know that it's, it's a matter of theories. Now, you said early yes. Christian area. 
era? Are you talking fourth century, fifth century? The the date we use for the purposes, um, we say the fourth century. There's some argument that it, it's it's early as the second century, um, and then there's certainly arguments that that date it way back earlier. But those are rather controversial and not largely embraced. Right. Now, what about, uh, I'm just trying to get some things out of the way here in the beginning so we can sort of understand what we've got here. Now, people have also heard the word, perhaps more often, the word runes. Yes. Which is also a sort of a system of, of, of carving and, and rocks that we've seen in the past. What's the difference between runes and uh, oom? Well, they're, they're certainly just different systems. Oom is generally recognized to be an Irish creation. Uh, runes seem to be um, Scandinavian in root. However, there's similarity between the two of them that they in some way uh, borrow from the Etruscan alphabet as far as the way that they're represented. That's right. And those Etruscans are a mystery still, aren't they? Yes, they are. Uh, and you even see um, parts of the Roman alphabet coming from Etruscan, but um, largely see influence in both uh, rune and in um, oum through Etruscan alphabet. Now, those those runes seem to have more of a drawing effect to them, more, more variation, whereas the oum is just like a series of lines, vertical, horizontal, maybe Correct. a little angle. Uh, so that's that's one key on that. So uh, uh, tell, there tell is us. Also, go ahead. There is... Um, a group of five symbols that were used later in Oum uh, called Forfeta. Uh, I do not use them. They came much later toward the end of Oum's use when it was largely used um, mostly in Great Britain in um, parchments and in um, script versus being done on stone or in trees. And what, what years or centuries are we talking about? You're, you're probably talking close to the end of the use of Ohm, which is 7th or 8th century. As, oh. When I say the end, I mean, Ohm was used, there's even somebody that uh, was using it in the 19th century on, um, on a gravestone. So it never really went away, but it lost its general use around the 7th or 8th century. Almost seems like as the Vikings start to grow in their influence and their incursions on the coast, Oum seems to decline. It, it does. And it's interesting you say that. Um, there's a very interesting example of an Oum stone. It's at uh, St. Flannan's Cathedral in Killaloe. And it's a stone that they found, I think it was around 1916. And it's got a Nordic rune writing and an oum writing on it it's got both i i kind of refer to it as an oum rosetta stone mm -hmm. and the um the nordic rune says thormir carved this cross and the oum translation says a blessing on Thor thorgamir so <laughs> um so do you think it's the same thing or you think it's two different messages it may be two different messages. I'm not sure. It's just uh, it's, it's just a fascinating example, and they've got that that stone particularly is preserved right in the cathedral. You mm -hmm. can just walk up and see it in there. Mm -hmm. well, and and so in, in Ireland, I, I I read once in a book on County Kerry that uh, they were talking about the first evidence of, of language, and they were tying it to the old territory of the O'Falvies and the O'Shea's. Uh, is there any truth to that? It would have been the ancient territory, of course. Yes, I mean, it is almost universally accepted that this is a southwestern uh, creation and that anything you see outside of that area is basically from somebody who took it with them and it may have been adapted for a brief period. But the concentration of what it still remains of Oum stones, which is very, very few in the world. There's only about 370 surviving, with the largest concentration of them being in Cork and in Kerry and in Waterford. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what are, you, are they gravestones? Are they territory markers? A little bit of both. Not necessarily gravestones. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I've heard it referred to the as gravestones, but I don't know that there's actually remains underneath them. They like were used as territory markers. Some argue that it was used um, to symbolize that um, a transaction had had occurred uh, between property, mm -hmm. that this land was now belonged to so-and-so or so-and-so, son of so-and-so. And 
uh, it would mark the territory, but it would also designate that there was, say, a new owner. I could see it. it might have marked the spot of a big battle where they conquered the territory and they put that up as commemoration. Uh, I think that's a natural inclination. Uh, what what else have you discovered since you've, you've spent so much time doing it? We get so seldom a, time, a chance to talk with somebody who's got this much uh, experience in that. Uh, what else strikes you about the language? Well, what strikes me is, is what you said, that there's so much controversy. You know, the, the, I don't think anybody is right. I think there's certain things people agree with. I mean, something simple like it is red bottom to top. Um, as far as if, it, if you turn it, if you go left to right or right to left, there's some argument on that. I've even heard that when it was on stone, it would have been right to left. But when it was on parchment, it was left to right. Well, you um, know, in the you, cases that we use, we actually go left to right because we do prints largely. Well, yeah, you have to pick pick one thing. I you have to that. pick one and just be consistent. And that was the biggest challenge was coming up with what we considered to be a consensus. Uh, we picked what we thought would be the oldest version of the alphabet, with the one exception being that we do use a P. Mm -hmm. In the earlier forms, they would have used a, a, the B letter to represent a soft uh, a soft P, B sound to, to uh, create the P. Hey, let me ask you this. Here's one more question that <laughs> just came up to my mind. You know, you take a look at the Irish, the Galga, uh, uh, and, and, and some of its peculiar, peculiarities in its spelling. Can you relate anything in the OM to the, the, the language, uh, the Irish language in the old, old days? Uh, somewhat. There is a... Um, one of the the letters is a series of strike marks that represents the uh, the, the combination of an ng or ng. Yeah. Uh, for example, Don Donegal, mm -hmm. which would be Dunagal, uh, mm -hmm. is one of the the rare times that we would use that um, in a translation. It, it's not needed anymore uh, because we would just use we use a simple letter for letter translation. And then replacement letters, because there's only 20 letters, and obviously we deal with 26. Sure, sure. What about, uh, uh, now, now, so you've done all this study and you're in Ireland. When did you decide to uh, do something with it, to, to bring it to the people, so to speak? Uh, it was probably about a year and a half ago, uh, two years at this point. Um, what ha basically happened was my, um, my son was born, and he was born in the winter, and I didn't want to take him out. And I had days where I needed to take uh, take care of him. And while I was in the house, I kind of I came across um, a book of mine where sometime, I guess, probably 15 years ago, I had written my name out in Oem and a little slip of paper fell out. And I decided to kind of retake it up as a hobby. And I started doing painting and um, just to really occupy time and. I would bring them as presents to people or, or gifts. And what would inevitably happen would be, well, could you do this name or could you do this word or could you do that? And um, I would do them. The, the, the real kicker for me came uh, in October of 2009. I went to Ireland to um, bury the, a small part of the remains of my father. And we were doing it on, on family property up in uh, Killy Beggs in Donegal. And as a, as, a, as a gift to the family, I made a, um, I did their name for them in Ulam and I brought it over. And it was very interesting to see the, uh, the Irish reaction to that, where the, the expectation would have been that everybody knew what Ulam was. And, uh, you know, I was in a house of about 50 or so um, Irish people, and many of them had a a knowledge of it, but really didn't understand it. So I ended up holding court and explaining Oem to a house full of Irish people. And when I came back, I thought, you know what? I, I think I'm onto something here. So I decided to to try to pursue it a little bit more professionally. Well, I've seen I've seen some uh, uh, plaques. I think they're, they're like the kind you offer. They have a a saying or a blessing or a, just a one symbol on there that yes. means means something, and you could hang it in your house, uh, tied to history, and it's also pretty. Now, yes. I, I saw another thing you had. It was It's a window, what do you call it? A window oh, something. The window clings, yes. Uh, those, um, as, as you know, uh, Irish people are very proud of their uh, 
their roots and their their counties. And, you know, you can drive through Cary and you will see everything in green and yellow because that's the color of the team jerseys, the town, mm-hmm. the, the county flag, et cetera. So we decided to try something a little different. And what we did was we took all of the counties, we took the, the four provinces and then obviously the country, and we do our window clings where we do them in English on the top. We do the middle in Oum. And then underneath the Oum is the Irish name of the county. And the Oum is actually of the Irish name, not the English name. Uh-huh. Um, and then we do them in count in the in the official county sporting colors, which are the, the most recognizable colors for the counties. Hey, I like that idea. That yeah, when I saw that, I thought that was very interesting. I'm a little unclear on it. Is, is this just when you say window cling? What does that mean? They're not stickers. They actually you put them in the window so the light can pass through them. So they're like uh, they're made out of what material? It's a it's like a um, it's printed on a plastic uh, okay. or like okay. a rubberized plastic. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. They actually don't stick either. They can be moved around. We have them, we, uh, some of the, the pubs uh, in Connecticut here, we've given them out and they have them in their windows and on their, um, we've even done reverse ones for some of the guys that want to put them on their mirrors. Hey, how about a uh, Christmas tree ornament? Would that work? You could just hang one of those on a Christmas tree? We actually do uh, Christmas tree ornaments as well. Oh my gosh. Yes, we have a, a Yule ornament that's done in glass and a wooden one that says uh, Nola Kona on one side, and on the reverse, it's got Nola Kona written in Owam. Oh, my gosh. What about uh, uh, if, if somebody's listening and they want their name maybe in uh, Owam and Irish and, and in uh, uh, English, will you do that for them? Well, what we do is we don't we, – we, we will do it. Yes, we do. That's, that's actually our primary um, business is we do um, names in Owam for people – and it's it's just Oum. There's no English translation on the front, and it's without a doubt our most popular item because it can serve many purposes. I mean, Oum is very um, striking. It's it's very orderly. It's 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 got uh, you know to borrow from from the Asian concept. It's very feng shui, and it looks very interesting. And you can put that in your house. And to the casual observer, it's just a very orderly piece of artwork. And if they ask you about it, you can say, well, do you know that that's my family's name written in ancient Irish? Um, That's what always fascinates people. We do a lot of um, trade shows and fairs and um, Irish festivals and things like that. And when people walk by the table, they initially think it's perhaps um, some sort of an Arabic script, or they think it's Native American or Asian. Mm-hmm. And when they find out that it's Irish, they they're just they, they just have to know more, and they want to know more. And tell me how this is Irish, and you know we certainly talk to them about it. And um, we do on right there on the spot, we will do their name on a card just to show them what it would look like, and then we can turn it into a print. Oh, that's very good. Now, now, when you say turn it into a print, do you silk screen it or do you print it on a printing press? Or it's a, it's actually a, a multi step process. Um, my my wife Colleen is the resident artist, and what she does is she writes it, she draws it out first um, just in pencil, and then she actually paints it um, with a calligraphy paint on um, a very thick watercolor paper. Oh, very nice. And then what happens is we actually scan it. And then we have a, um, a printing company in Connecticut here that um, they're called CompuMail, and they have a very, very specific printing machine. It's, it's called, um, it's a Nexpress digital printing machine. Mm-hmm. And many people are aware of a, of a four-color printing process. Uh, what they use is actually a five-color printing process. And the fifth color is a clear glaze. So when they print it out, it actually dimensionalizes the print. It looks like it's painted on stone when it comes out. Ooh, very and nice. It's, 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 it's beautiful, and, you know, we're just very lucky that um, there's not many of those machines in the world, and we happen to have one in our town, so it works out quite well for us. Ooh, that makes it pretty unique. What uh, For people listening or listening all over the states, all over the world, really, what, uh, what festivals have you been going to? We've done some, basically been restricted to Connecticut and Massachusetts um, in the early days. We, we only launched our website in October. Um, we're getting ready right now for our, um, obviously, St. Patrick's Day next month, and we've got some things planned for that. 
Um, and then we're going to be hitting a lot of the Connecticut festivals this summer. Um, Connecticut has four major Irish festivals uh, throughout the summer. Uh, we've got uh, Fairfield, uh, North Haven, Danbury, and Glastonbury all lined up for this summer. Oh, boy. Well, I hope you get the time, but you might end up just uh, taking this. Is, is this full time? It is for my wife. Well, you might end up taking it full time, renting a trailer and putting a bunch of ohm letters in that truck and just driving around for all the summer festivals. I would love to do that. My my, my ultimate wish is that this become a staple in um, in Irish gift shops that you walk in and, you know, you walk into any one of them, just like you see the uh, the tins of Buleys and the um the clatter, the, the, the clatter doilies and things that you would walk in and see a, an OM art uh, display in almost in every store across this country. That's that's the goal. Yeah, boy, that would be nice. You could have little uh, pre predetermined kits that uh, yep. uh, you know with with certain names and that that sort of thing. Uh, well, on the website we do offer we do offer sayings. We do Anam Kara. We do Kate Mefalcha. We do Aaron Gobra. We and we also have preset all family relationships so for example if you just wanted father we do we already have a father all of the males are a blue background and then we do the oem in a color that we felt represented the the person's position for example so um son um son as in bo like boy son is actually a yellow whereas father is brown and grandfather is gray and we did the same thing with the female. We did a, a green background, and then a girl is pink, and grandmother is a, a nice lavender, and they work well together. They can be framed together as a presentation gift, or, for example, you could take the photograph of your father and put the father next to it. We we offer that service. If you send us a digital print, we will... Um, We'll put it right in the frame for you and send it right out to you. Ooh, good. That sounds like fun. You know, I might try to get a hold of you before the uh, Dublin, Ohio Festival. I, I think I've gone there 11, 12 years in a row now. But they got about 100,000 people come through, and uh, I haven't seen any of the uh, – a nice selection of, of ohm-type things there. I've, you know, some of the little cards that are just sort of printed mimeograph-type thing, but not the right. real, real good stuff. So I might get a hold of you in uh, – exhibit for you just uh to let people know you're out there that uh we could certainly talk about that that would be great hey what else do you know about uh uh the irish language or anything the om any other uh i studied irish briefly in the late uh 90s at, at the uh the fairfield irish club which is a club that i was a member of for i have actually been a member for over 20 years um it's my my knowledge is very um, casual at best, and I certainly try to pick it up on my trips to Ireland. I've been to Ireland uh, at least a dozen times at this point, and mm -hmm. um, try to pick up something. I can I can read more than I can speak. You know, if I see a word, I can generally figure out what it means. Hey, I tell you, I, I, the thing I like the most is consonant clusters and the role of the H. Yes, in, in the alphabet, and you go back and you say, "How did this happen? And why would they put something in that's not really a letter?" And it looks like, to me, at least in several occasions, it's they do this to the, a conqueror will come in and say, "Well, this language doesn't fit our language," and they use that H just to uh, to turn something into a different sound or something they can recognize. I'm not too sure. Yeah, I would certainly not uh, hazard a guess at how, how that how that developed but the you know the romans wrote backwards uh, back as if i can tell what's forwards and backwards but you know the romans their alphabet was backwards and forwards and uh uh it just depended on the on the person who was carving the stone i think and they were leaving in, in the early days they left the uh the vowels out altogether. yes uh which i find fascinating it's sort of like reading uh, license plates today you have to add the uh the vowel sound in that's uh, right it's just it's just a fascinating subject. Well, I'm glad they got the vowels in on the OM. They did, yes. Uh, any uh, parting thoughts? And be sure to leave, uh, give us whatever you want to for contact information. People listening will be listening all year long and probably some more. Uh, how should they contact you? Well, they can always go to the website, which is omart.com. That's O-G-H-A-M-A-R-T.com. Uh, we do have a toll-free number. It's one 305 
7819. Um, if you send us an email through the website, you're going to get either me, Chris, or my wife, Colleen. We will get back to you. We, we certainly work with people. Uh, very often, people will just send us an email and say, I need a gift for my 19-year-old daughter. What do you recommend? And we work, we work with people to, to design a gift that's you know, exactly what they want. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're available. We, we, this is, while we do have a lot of stock pieces that we sell and they're very, very popular, um, we like working with people and making sure that their OEM is uh, unique to them. So actually to the point that uh, my wife was at a show and she took two orders for the same name, um, it, it just not people that were not together, but she got two Gallagher's. And something we're very proud of is that she painted a Gallagher and then she moved on and she painted another Gallagher. So those two Gallagher's were not the same one. We could have easily painted one, made two copies of it, but yeah. we don't do that. We, 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 if we tell you we're going to make it for you, we're going to make it for you. Hey, that makes it an art. That makes it special. It does. Yes. And I, I can see a picture here of Colleen. I think why she looks like she's redheaded. She is now. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And it's a freedom of choice. We salute here too. Right. Uh, any parting comments? I think this has been a really fascinating uh, conversation. Anything uh, else you want to comment on? No, just, um, you know, I, we, we're on a campaign right now to get ourselves into Irish shops. So certainly if any of your listeners own Irish shops or if they know people that do, we'd love to hear from them, maybe get them out a couple of samples and uh, see if they're, if OMR is something they'd like to add to their product mix. Okay, great. Well, this is uh, we're either going to run this on Hello Fada or on the Irish Family uh, uh, Research Network. We don't know which. We might put it on both. It's so good. And uh, hang on here. I want to talk to you after we get going. But this is Michael Laughlin at the Irish Roots Cafe saying hello, Fada. Hello, Fada is a presentation of the Irish Head School at www.irishroots.com. These introductory sessions are for those curious about the Irish language and for those considering a course of study in the future. Contact us on our webpage at irishroots.com or by mail at the Irish Roots Cafe, Box 7575, Kansas City, Missouri, 64116. Leave a message on our phone recorder at 816-256-3360. Your hedge school needs your support. Sponsors and memberships are always welcome. So ends another session from the sunny side of the hedge. Oh, the 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 oh,